So let's talk about our paper as long as we're, we've got some time left. So let's spend the rest of the time for talking about the paper. Now this paper I picked because it had some discussion of the uh, double air capacitance and detection of that using a, at a mercury electrode and you could see the capacity voltage curves directly that people have measured. Is there any, um, any questions about the paper? Uh, anything that was puzzling to you or you thought was interesting? I got a few questions here. First of all, they, they are talking about acetonite trial at the beginning. They say that it was rectified using a 1.5 meter column. What, what, what does it mean by rectified? Purified? Well, they, if you notice, they start in the experimental section on the, pa on the first page. Yeah. It says ultra pure substances are necessary in the field of double air investigations. No. So why, why now do we need these ultra pure uh, substances? What, what would be the problem if we didn't have ultra pure substances? If we're interested in just measuring um, surface tension impurities, might um, we might get paradigm uh, currents that we are not interested in. That's right. There, we could have some material that could be oxidized or reduced during the process of this investigation, and we don't want any of that happening, do we? We want to just study the capacity of the electrode and not the electron transfer <laughs> properties of the electron. That's one reason. What is there another reason you could think of? What would be the effect if we had some other molecule in there that could absorb on the electric surface that wasn't what we were interested in? <coughs> the capacitors will not be Right, we're going we're gonna to absorb their technical word is crud on the electrode. Mm -hmm. And this crud is by definition crud, so we don't know what's going on in the surface. Okay, it could be any sort of thing. And unless we take pains to remove this material, we're going to have and some unknown amount of it and some unspecified amount are going to be absorbed and with time more will absorb and so that'll cause our experiment to change. So they're really very carefully purifying the material. So going back to Yvonne's question, where you're talking about this rectified using a 1.5 meter column, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Well, it just uh, that's just basically talking about distilling it. They're distilling it a number of times. They're using a rectified to indicate that process. And then they're, you know, they're taking uh, some fraction of it, and then they, and then they uh, check the absorbance at various uh, UV absorbances, see if there's any impurities that show up in the absorption spectrum, that's, a, that's one, one way they can tell. Then they treat it with sodium hydride, lithium aluminum hydride, that is and also designed to remove water from the system. Now why, is, why would they want to remove water from this acetyl nitro? What's the, what's the problem? I mean, water would be also another thing that would absorb quite strongly to the surface because it's polar and so when you polarize the mercury, Electrode, the water is going to be stuck to the surface, probably. And also, it can be electroactive. Yeah, that, that would cause problems. It's really difficult. That's one of the most difficult things to do is to get rid of water from these systems. Even if, even probably, even after they've gone through all this procedure, the amount of water was still probably more than two or three millimolar concentration of water in that system. So there's just no way to get the water completely removed from the system. But you have to go with, you have to at some point assume it's small enough that it doesn't really make any difference. Which may or may not be a good assumption. 
they're doing uh, then then they're doing some things where they're taking it through charcoal, which is to get rid of some organics and the alumina. Uh, again, the alumina is supposed to absorb the organics and water associated with that, and so on. Um, any other questions about that? I think it, you can see they really went to a lot of trouble uh, to get things to get things good. Um, the question in the experimental part, they said um, in page 317, they said by the locking technique, the in-phase and out-phase component of the cell current could be measured separately. What is the locking technique? And yeah, well, lock, you know, what they're talking about is using a lock-in amplifier. It's a specific kind of amplifier that designed to look at alternating current signals. The idea of the locking amplifier is suppose I have a, uh, an oscillating signal. And usually we're talking about using it to remove noise, but in this case they're doing it in a very specific way to detect the phase of that oscillating signal. You, what you're going to do is you're going to put in a signal that oscillates at voltage and you're going to measure a current at the output. Now, if it's a current that goes through just the capacitor, you'll get a, a 90 degree lead on the capacitive signal. So I'm not drawing it right, but let's see. So you get a 90 degree shift that leads the voltage. So the current out will lead the voltage by 90 degrees. And that's so you want to know if I measure the phase of the current with respect to the phase of the signal that I've applied, I can tell what the relation, relationship is between capacitor and the resistance of the cell. If I have a complete zero degree phase shift, there's no, that means that the capacitance is very small and the resistance is the most important or the resistance of part of it is more important. And uh, so the, they talk about their cell having a, a something like this, where this is the double layer and this is the solution resistance. What happens when we make the, when we make the, when we make the frequency of through here very small, close to DC, the capacitor acts as a blocking that no, no uh, current flows under those conditions and alternating current because it's, the capacitor is a blocker for that. As you go to high frequency signals, the capacitor does not really block any of the, of the response, but the, re resist the, the resistance starts to uh, become important. And so you'll see a shift in phase as you change the frequency. And by looking at the shift in phase as a function of frequency, or by knowing what the solution resistance is in the first place, you can actually determine the double layer capacitance by the shift that you see out. So the lock-in amplifier, what it's doing is it says, okay, I'm going to take that signal, and it's a little tricky, but you can say, I can take that signal and I'm going to multiply it by a square wave. And if the signal is exactly in phase with the square wave, like so, what am I going to get out? I'm going to get out a rectified signal, which means that all the signal will be positive, like so. You see? Because this is negative, that's negative, so it's positive. Now, if I multiply this by a signal that's shifted by 90 degrees, that's harder for me to draw this, but let me see if I can get it. Make it there we go the signal that we're going to get out. Well, in any particular point, we're not going to get, it won't be rectified like this. It'll be, this will be positive here and this will be uh, negative. So we'll go, like something like that. In other words, we don't have rectify. But now if we filter this, so that only the low pass frequency that we filtered out, you'll get a, a, a signal above zero for this case, a signal at zero at this, in this case. Can you see that? 
It's like, in, well, it, the filtering is like integrating that response. If we integrate this response, we're going to get a, a non-zero response. If we integrate this, we're going to get a zero. So the ratio above zero tells us what the phase is. So you know, you can think of the math. You can do the math, but you can tell what the phase is depending on how much signal you get out at the end. And so there's going to be an in phase and out of phase component to our. Basically, what that says is some, if something is in phase with the original signal, some phase is out. These are vector amounts that you're talking about. So the vector quantities that they're measuring, some, some will be in phase, some will be out of phase. And so they're just saying, well, some may be at 30 degrees shifted, some may be 40 degrees shifted. And that tells you the relative amount of current that's associated with a capacitive signal and some that's associated with a resistance. And that tells you. What the, and so by measuring the phase shift, you can measure the, the capacitance. And so that's what that's doing. Um, and they, they change the frequency from 60 to 10,000 hertz, um, and so on. What do they mean by the no frequency dispersion occurred in the frequency range? It's in the same page, just in the next paragraph. Uh, that's the reference yeah. what, well, that's a little technical. Uh, that's a problem with one. Sometimes when you're doing these experiments, you see phase shifts that would not necessarily be associated with just a simple cell that's a, a resistor and a capacitor. Uh, for example, there may be some inductance in the cell leads, or if there's a Faraday process occurring, you would not get the kind of phase shift you'd expect for a resistor capacitor. And they lump that under a dispersion. And so in other words, anything that's not associated, expected in, under these systems. And so you see a dispersion effect. And what they're saying is that since we didn't see any of that, we're, we're saying we're still getting a good signal. We're not seeing additional non-modeled effects. Because you know, this sort of measurement assumes a model that the, the cell is this resistor and this capacitor only. So in order to get the data, they have to assume this and get the data out that way. So what they're doing is they're, mod they're oscillating the potential, they're measuring a current, they're putting it through this, what they call locking amplifier. That gives us the relative phase shift of the signal and by doing the mathematical analysis of that, they can tell what the capacitance is of that thing. They have to know the solution resistance, but once they've measured the solution resistance, any signal that they see, they can directly convert to capacity. Or capacitance. <clears throat> what they, they mean here also on the same page, a couple of things. They say that in the absence of uh, Faraday currents, which has been proved carefully, how, how can you prove this? That there is no. I saw it in the graphs, but I. Where it starts to increase in, in, in the curves here. The yeah. Would affect the, the shape of the. Well, I don't know how they, they didn't say how they proved it. I assume they did a lot of tests where they did current voltage curves and they make, made sure there was no current flowing under any potential, at the potential that they were interested in and so on. Um, they also say that they, they measured the potential of zero charge. Using streaming electrode, what's this? What uh, well, I'm not sure exactly how that experiment is done, but the idea is that they they measure what they call streaming potentials, and it's a it's a measurement that you can do. I, I can't remember exactly how that experiment is done, but what it tells you is a, is the PZC. Now, I guess I was most interested in looking at these current capacity voltage curves, and. Um, I wanted you to note, in particular, the effect of capacity on the uh, ion size. And we have a number of different ions. What's the, the system is this, these tetraalkyl ammonium ions. So we've got tetrabutyl is, is one, but we've got tetramethyl. Tetramethyl is just the, got the methyl groups, ethyl, propyl, butyl. And then um, tetraheptyl and uh, tetra 
something else, I guess. Tetra. Yeah, tetra and hepto, and then tetra and then ammonium perchlorate. These are all perchlorate salts. Now they've assumed that the perchlorate salt or the perchlorate ion is uh, not involved in any specific absorption to the electrode surface. They're talking about the the cation of the tetraalkyl ammonium ion is is the important thing that's absorbed to the electrode surface. And first of all, you notice you got that that um, that minimum right there at uh, close to zero volts in all of the electrodes. And that minimum is usually thought to be the PZC, but it actually is uh, not exactly the PZC. It's in this case that they call it the E minimum. It's close to the PZC, but it's not necessarily exactly the PZC. Why is that capacitance so low at that particular point? What's the reason for that low capacitance? What's that mean to you when you see that low capacitance? Why, let's let's go, let's go back. Why is the why do we have a capacitance in the first place? Because of the arrangement of the, the layers, the layer between the electrode and the solution. Right. It's a charge separation in the interface. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we have a low capacitance, what's that mean? Thinner layer. Now thinner layers would tend to increase the capacitance if we kept everything else the same. Mm -hmm. That, um, Plus, if, bulkier group. Yeah, if we made the groups bulkier, that would make it less capacitance, but we're, in, the, in a particular curve, say figure three, we, we have changed the group that's assigned, right? So why is the, what's the, what's happening there at that minimum to cause the capacitance to drop? Absorption. That's right. We, 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 at that particular point, the potentials are such that there's no real attractive force for these ions to be absorbed at the electrode. Remember, they're not stuck to the electrode. They're just in excess of there. There's some, they're going to move there because there's a potential or a charge on the metal. And at that particular point, there's no particular charge in the metal, so there's no reason for them to move close to it. And so the capacity is less because there's no there's not any charge in the solution nearby for the capacitor to, to be there. Uh, and me, I'm confused a little bit. There, there is there is no charge, or there is there is not excess excess charge. Right. There's there's no charge in excess of what would sort of be there normally. Okay. Because there is still ions there in the solution, and mm -hmm. it's, they're not going to be. There's no ze there's not zero charge there, but there's just not an excess amount of charge. Okay. That's what they call a specific excess charge. And so you still see a capacitance, especially when you go to higher um, higher charges. And now remember the Gooey Chapman Stern idea. It says that when we have this um, the minimum capacitance, that's when we have uh, this diffuse layer is the most prominent part of the capacitive thing. And that's because now when we don't really have any real strong attractive force to get the molecules to be at the OHP, our ions to get the OHP, now the capacitance is limited, is, is really what they, we'd see if we just had this collection nearby the electrodes. But when we have a higher attractive force, now they're sucked up next to that OHP. And they can't get any closer to that. Now the capacitor capacitance basically doesn't change too much at that point. So why does the capacitance go to, as we go higher concentrations, why does it approach the value at more negative potentials, or even gets bigger, actually? What, what happens to that dip? Why does that dip go away?
what would, what, what's happening when we have more molecule, more ions in the solution? Why would we see a competition for the side? Yeah, I mean, rather than having these ions just floating around near the electrode, now there's enough of them that there's just going to be some by just because there's so many, there's some of them are going to be next to the electrode surface. So we pushed more ions near the electrode surface, so now the capacitance really, even though there's not a lot of attraction for those molecules at the electrode, just because there's more of them, there, there will be more near the electrode surface. So as we increase the capacity, that, that physical effect happens. And, um, okay, let's compare, we're running out of time here, but let's compare, for example, the tetramethyl Tetraethyl. As we go from tetramethyl, tetraethyl, tetrapropyl, tetrabutyl, what's happening to the electrode? Is it getting bigger or smaller? Or this ion, is it getting bigger or smaller? It's bigger. It's bigger. What's happening to the capacitor, especially at the more negative potentials? It's not so obvious, you have to look carefully. But what's happening to the capacitor, say, at minus 2 volts? Getting smaller. Smaller. Understood. Well, and it's getting more straight. St straight too, isn't it? So why is that? Why is it getting smaller as we make our ion bigger? Laura had the idea before about this. The bulk. The it's too bulky to get in there. Right, we've, now we've got this bigger separation between the, as the ions get bigger, it's just going to get farther away from the surface, so the capacitance will drop for that particular reason. Um, now, as we increase the potential more negative, you saw that uh, with the tetramethyl on figure two, the capacitance starts to pick up a little bit and as it continues to go as we make the <coughs> potential smaller uh, or the, the ions bigger I should say it gets straighter um, but then we go to really small electrodes and it picks up again the ammonium perchlorate so probably what's happening when we have the smaller electrodes is that we can have enough negative charge on that electrode to start to get specific absorption of these cations onto the electrode surface. In other words, we're going from these ions being at the OHP to being enough charge to really pull them right into the inner Helmholtz plane. So they're stuck to the electrode surface. And that, in that case, you can see why the capacitance will increase dramatically in those cases. Now we've gone from a system where they're separated by the OHP to where they're separated by the IHP, so much closer to the surface now that the separation is smaller, so we can get a higher capacitance. And that kind of is what you see for the alkali metal perchlorates in figure nine, uh, although it's not as obvious. They didn't go out as far negative. But the ammonium perchlorate curve and the curves for, say, lithium and not lithium, but uh, cesium and potassium are similar. This door down here. Well, we're, we're probably out of time. But, um, is there anything else that anybody really is interested in? But if you read this paper, it's really quite interesting. You can see at the end they've made quite a bit of fairly interesting observations based on those curves that are just how these ions are associated with the electrode surface. And they're not definitive proof that that's happening, but they're pretty, it's, some, it's a pretty good insight into the, what's happening at that surface just by some fairly simple current or capacity voltage curves uh, on the system. So that's, I thought that was interesting. The next, the next uh, paper is also some more stuff about modified electrodes. It has a little bit to do with phi 2 effects in the top.
talk about that next time.